Hi, good morning, guys. So uh, let's move on to the next topic that is the motor system. So let me share the screen. Right here, All right? Okay. Yeah. So let's go guess to the beginning. This one. So just uh, we finished the sensory system, we're moving on to the motor system. So just uh, get the, like, the entire map to see where we are in the nervous system. So we showed this before, this is the nervous system, it has uh, two branches, central and the peripheral. And uh, So the center is the one that communicates with the in the in the brain, right? In the in the brain spinal cord uh, within the the duramater or the piamater. And uh, the periphery, peripheral nervous system is the nerve that interacts with non-nerve. And what's non-nerve? There are two types. One is the sensory, meaning that they interact with non-nerve. That is the outside signal. And this sensory are, can be divided into two parts, the cranial sensory. So this is uh, including our vision, uh, smell, test, hearing. We use the vision as the example to cover this part. The dorsal root ganglion, this is the somatic sensory. So we talk about that. Now the motor is another peripheral meaning that it interacts with non-neuron. With what kind of non-neuron? The muscle. There are two type, uh, three type of muscle: skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac outside. Skeletal muscle is right here. Skeletal motor. This is the voluntary motor movement. The smooth muscle, cardiac outside, are controlled by autonomic, that, that's not what we can control, right? So, so that's the control by the autonomic. And uh, this part we uh, basically mentioned about this when we talk about all different organs, in particular, the cardiovascular system, the heart and the vessel, the heart and the vessel are, are, are the, uh, uh, controlled by the autonomic, the very, very basic, the very uh, the uh, important one. Heart is the uh, cardiac muscle size, the smooth muscle, the vessels is smooth muscle. So we can in increase the stroke volume, increase the vessel constriction, vessel dilation. All of these are controlled by autonomic. Autonomic has two branches, sympathetic and the parasympathetic. So we talk about the neurotransmitter uh, in the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. We also use the uh, pupil dilation constriction to explain how this neurotransmitter can have different effects in different organs. So that's that. Now today we are going to talk about this part, the motor system. This motor system, as you probably should know that this is uh, another like big, big group of the uh, knowledge that we can, we can, uh, we need to understand. Yeah. And uh, that, that involves many, many parts of our nervous uh, uh, portion. So let's look into it. So if we look into this motor system, this voluntary motor system, uh, we, can look into these circuits, this group of the, uh, the nerve system involved in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the voluntary movement. So, so uh, this is the uh, block diagram. This is the anatomy, the fiber tracks. So basically that from the motor cortex to the 
thalamus, basal cerebellum, brainstem, spinal cord. All these are controlled by, or all these are involved in the movement. So think about that, any movement that you want to conduct, you need to think that it's not just your thought and the muscle, that simple. It's involved to have a smooth movement. It need to involve all this. So you can imagine that any damage, any deficit in one of these will cause the motor function deficit. deficit. So what, what are these? So basically these movements in the end is to control the lower motor uh, neuron, lower motor neuron lo located in the, uh, in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So here is the lower motor neuron will conduct the movement. When it conducts the movement, it's not just move, it will trigger a sensory because you need to know that we have the proprioception. So any change in our muscle, in our skeletal muscle, will trigger this proprioception and to trigger that group of the sensory. So that's that. And this sensory will then send signal back to the spinal cord through the dorsal root of the spinal cord. And you need to know that can also trigger the movement, trigger the muscle. That is called a reflex. This is very important. You must be thankful that we are not talking about a complicated reflex. This is the monosynaptic reflex, the stretch reflex that plays an important role to maintain our movement smoothness. So we don't, we are not talking about like big signs. Here is very simple circuit here. However, that simple circuit is so beautifully present and uh, that is good enough to maintain our muscle smooth movement. So that made me really appreciate how everything is designed. You know, when you when you figure out how these things are designed, you can you cannot stop amazed, be amazed by how these are all designed. That's um yeah, so that's the beauty of learning physiology. You are you are looking into the instrument created by God. You know, it's not like human-made artificial stuff. This is yeah, this is uh, amazing. All right, so that's that. Uh, and so just keep in mind that we will talk about this one here uh, when we see this uh, stretch reflex. You need to kind of have that um like a uh, appreciation that this is an important mechanism to control smooth movement. This is the, the lower motor uh, system and then they are, they are basically controlled by all other. Here we have one, two, three, four, four pieces of these different nuclei and, uh, and, uh, and they basically directly indirectly affects this lower motor neuron. Uh, so, so basically, the basically there are four tracks from the upper motor neuron. Uh, from the brainstem, we have the inference from the cerebellum. So this one is to conduct the uh, the uh, vestibular spinal tracts to affect the spinal cord, to affect lower motor, lower, motor, lower motor neuron. And we also, and that one affects the body balance. Brainstem also contains the uh, reticular formation. So reticular spinal tracts affects the lower motor neuron. This reticular formation affects our muscle tone. We also have another one is the red nucleus right here. Rubrous spinal tracts affects the voluntary movement. Uh, and also, we also, and all these, all these, all these three, uh, vestibular, uh, what's the else? Vestibular, radicular, and uh, rubro spinal tracts 
are all affected by the cerebellum. So cerebellum is going to be our next topic that we will talk about, how cerebellum is so important to affect our movement. So all these three, uh, we will, we will, maybe I can write it down here. So we have the vestibular, vestibular, So all these three, all these three located in the brainstem affects by the cerebellum. Vestibular spinal tracts, reticular spinal tracts from the reticular formation, vestibular nuclear right here. Vestibular of course also affects from the vestibular apparatus. So cerebellum vestibular apparatus is gonna be our next topic. Red nuclear uh, send out the rubro spinal tracts affects the motor and the red nucleus receives signal from the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex as well as cerebellum affects the red nucleus to control the low motor neuron. So that's two, that's these three tracks. We also have a cerebral cortex send out the cortical spinal tracks to the lower motor neuron. This one is the one to control the voluntary movement. So vestibular keeping our body balance, reticular control our muscle tone, and the red nucleus with the uh, uh, cortical spinal tracts affects our voluntary movement. So that's that. And so that's these two portion. Now, another portion that's kind of like a background uh, calculation is this one, this circuit. This circuit involves the cerebral cortex, basal ganglia, thalamus. This circuit involves the calculation, the planning. So because for example, any, any movement, even though you probably think it's simple, just pick up a piece of like a pencil, this is movement involves so many things. It really depends on if you sit or if you stand, if you need to bend your, bend your, uh, your, bend yourself, <laughs> bend your body, or uh, you need to turn your head, etc. And so, and also, even if you just want to grab it, there is a sequence of this movement, different muscle, different motor units, and different time. So you need to plan everything. Even though they, it may seem that you don't really do it, someone do it in the back. That is this circuit. Cerebral cortex, basal ganglia, and the thalamus. This one, this circuit do it. So this circuit basically is the one to, to decide, to make a decision that what is the sequence? Should we do it now or should we do it later? So basal ganglia is very important. Uh, disease in the basal ganglia basically inf influence your movements. Uh, the major disease is the uh, Parkinson disease, Huntington disease. All this affects the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia has about uh, five major nuclei. Uh, if we make, make, it, make it more divided, it may have seven different regions. And the, all this, any damage to that will affect the, uh, affects the movement. Any changes here, for example, uh, addiction, not addiction, yeah, addiction. So if this, because basal ganglia also involved in the reward circuit, so uh, any movements lead, in, lead to the pleasure will, will, will tend to con uh, influence this calculation and uh, make these people tend to do that movement even more. So that is the uh, foundation of the addiction right here. This one also affects the, for example, the, uh, the uh, yeah, yeah. 
So, so that's that. So that's this circuit. And this circuit is basically that uh, is that cerebral cortex will send signal into the into the basal ganglia before it's sending out the signal. It will send to a basal ganglia, send to the thalamus, and do this calculation. Then lay out the plan of the movements, timing, components, and then send to the spinal cord to complete that. So that's that. So basically, we will talk about this portion, this portion, this, this portion today. And then next one, we will talk about the cerebellum and the vestibular. And then we will talk about this circuit. So we will use three lecture to complete this. And that basically is perfect to finish everything before the final. And that basically may fit into our uh, our uh, schedule list in the syllabus. We have this, this uh, even though the, uh, the title is this separately, but basically that's lower spinal cord, cerebellum, vestibular, and also basal ganglia and the cerebral cortex. So that's that. All right. So let's start by talking about this portion, the lower motor neuron. The lower, when we talk about this lower motor neuron, we need to come back to look at the muscle. So this is the muscle. And uh, in here, um, in the very large portion of this muscle is the muscle controlled by the the uh, the alpha motor neuron right here. Alpha motor neuron. This alpha motor neuron. Why do we call it alpha? Because they use type A alpha fiber. So we just have the quiz, and uh, I think one of the question is about the fiber thickness in terms of the A alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and the type C. Type A is myelinated, type C is unmyelinated, and the A alpha is the one that's the most fastest one, the fastest one. So that's the alpha, A alpha, uh, sorry, the alpha motor neuron influence the muscle to conduct the muscle contr contraction. And we know everything about that. It's our third, second lecture, something like that, right? The motor control, everything about the muscle. And, uh, and about last week or two weeks ago, we talked about the uh, acetylcholine. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. All right. So this uh, last week we talked talk about the SR calling. So we talk about everything about this. And that is the one to control this. So you can see that single single motor neuron may innervate multiple muscle. And uh, we call this muscle because they're gonna be contract all together by this motor neuron. So we call these muscles as a motor unit. So that's the, we, and this group muscle is called the extrafusal, extrafusal muscle, where do you say? Extrafusal muscle fibers. In addition to that, even though that's a majority of the muscle and that's a muscle to conduct the force of, of the movement, we also have a very small portion, but the very important portion inside of, in the center, in the belly of this, this muscle organ. This muscle is called the intrafusal muscle, right here, intrafusal muscle fiber. This intrafusal muscle fiber is, is different. This is the one that wrapped around by the muscle spindle. And, uh, and uh, so that, that provide the the uh the the uh the basis for the muscle sensory, so uh so the extrafusal only have one innervation in each muscle, the intrafusal muscle fibers has multiple innervation. It include the sensory innervation, 
uh, to uh, to sense the muscle stretch. The, this sensory, this muscle spindle has two types. One is the primary ending muscle spindle, like this one here. It also has no, another one is the secondary ending muscle spindle. The secondary ending muscle spindle located on the side side of this of this uh, hydrofusal muscle fiber. In addition, it's also innervated by the gamma motor neuron. So you can imagine that, that these two groups are quite very different. The extrafusal muscle fiber only have one innervation and their function is to conduct the muscle control contraction. The intrafusal muscle fiber has very small portion, about 2% of the total, but it's, 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 it's innervated by not just one nerve, but maybe two or more nerves. Uh, has the primary ending, has the secondary ending, has the gamma motor neuron innervated here. So it's, it provides the muscle contraction, small portion, not very big, but the major function is to provide the sensory. Now with this sensory, it includes the primary sensory, primary ending, and the secondary ending. Uh, this primary ending, you can see that its nerve is to use a type 1A. The secondary is to use type 2. So the terminology here is is uh, they use here a different system was is used. So typically that way, when we talk about the nerve fiber, we can classify them as a alpha beta gamma delta to C uh, and the C and the myelin unmyelinated. Uh, that's for general nerve fiber. We can also classify them as the type one, two, three, and the four. One, two, three are the myelinated. Type four is the unmarinated. So that basically is talking about the same thing, it's just different terminology, different way to um, classify them. And uh, the uh, for the muscle spindle, it's very common uh, for the muscle spindle, uh, Golgi tendon organ, it's very common to see that people use type one, two, uh, that way to classify them. And uh, in the in particular, this is something that you 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 need to keep in mind is that people sometimes don't call it the primary ending, secondary ending, because in the end of the day, it's it's easier to identify the fiber. It's it's fiber. You don't need to dissect the muscle. You can just look into the fiber, and you can you can know that this is the primary or secondary. Just measure the fiber size, and you can know that. So, so a lot of time we will see uh, in the literature, we say this is inference of type one alpha innovation or inference by type two. And when you, when you see that you need to immediately think that type one alpha, type one A is the one that's the primary ending. Type two, inference by type two is the secondary ending. Why is that important? What's the difference between type one a and a type two. When people talk about this is influenced by type one A, and uh, it's a it's influenced by type two. What what's the difference? You need to, you need to bring back to our sensor. It's not far away, right? This is just about two weeks ago that we talked about the sensory. When we talk about the sensory, one thing that I mentioned over and over again is that the lo the similar location we have two type of nerve sensory. Why do we need to have two? Because their adaptation are different. Same location, different sensory. Why? Because they have different adaptation. It's the same thing applies here. So the muscle spindle, we have the primary, the type A, uh, type 1A type, the, the type 1A fiber, and the type 2, a difference, adaptation. So. So the uh, 
uh, let's look into this one here. So here is the two type of the muscle spindle, uh, type 1A and the type 2. Here, these, just keep in mind that muscle spindle are slow, have low slow adaptation, no matter what. So whether that's type 1A, type 2, these are all slow adaptation. These are the proprioception. You cannot, our brain need to know where is your finger all the time. We cannot lose the tracks on them, even if they are not moving or anything. So, so it's slow adaptation. It continually sends signal into the brain. All right. Now, what's the difference then? The difference is that the type one stopped firing. So this is the stimulation. This is mechanical di displacement that the muscles stretch. When it stretch, both type one, type two send out signal. When it stop stretch, when it's relax, type one stop sending signal. Type two continue resend signal with a slower rate. So that's the difference. Type one A is a primary one. They don't fire during relaxation. Type two is the is the uh, is the uh, secondary one. It's a uh, it continuous sending signal during the relaxation. So the type one A is also called the dynamic fiber. The type two is called the static fiber. So I need to put an A here. For some reason that A is missing. So that make more sense here, All right? So that's that. So that's that. And also one thing that uh, this uh, type 1A is also called annual spiral is because of the shape. The uh, type two is also called flower spray ending. That's because of the shape, All right? And uh, here showing you that this, this basically is the table that we showed earlier when we talk about the nervous system, the sensory nervous system. So uh, two of these ending was there and uh, just repeat here, type 1A is one to describe the uh, muscle spindle primary ending. Type two is one to describe the secondary ending of the muscle spindle. And so the muscle has extrafusal, intrafusal. This one, uh, extrafusal are innervated by single type of the nerve. That is the alpha motor neuron. They use the A alpha fiber. And uh, type uh, intrafusal innervated by gamma motor neuron uh, using the A gamma. And so that's two different muscles. Mm, one is the, and uh, uh, A alpha, the other one is A gamma. And uh, all these lower motor neuron are located in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. So we, we, we know that, that the dorsal root is the sensory, the ventral root or the anterior horn is the, uh, is the motor. So, and so let's look into what is this gamma motor neuron? Why is that important? We know that we know that the alpha is for the muscle control, atrafusal, we know its function. We know the intrafusal, we have these muscle spindle and uh, that detect the muscle. Muscle stretch, that's also very important. Then what, what's the importance of this gamma? This gamma stretch, the intrafusal, what is the, what is the relevance, relevance here? So the, the importance of this gamma motor neuron is to cause a stretch reflex. 
So that's what I mentioned earlier. This one here, stretch reflex. That is this one here. This one here. This is the the uh, the uh, the main tricky part of this gamma motor neuron because gamma, when gamma innervate it, it stretch this intrafusal only. So the muscle actually is not force, generate force at all, but it stretch it. And the, the, the immediate inference is to signal, send out a signal from this muscle spindle. When they stretch it, when the gamma motor neuron ending to the both side of the muscle, it, stretch, it, it contract the side, it stretch the center. When it stretch the center, the muscle spindle will send signal into the spinal cord. And that induce a stretch reflex. And then when it stretch reflex, this muscle will contract. Why do we need that? Why do gamma number neuron cause this trouble? Because by doing so, we can maintain a muscle tone. So that is the, the very, very basic portion of the gamma motor neuron. The very basic function of this gamma motor neuron is not to cause the force of the muscle, but just by simple contraction in the intrafusal muscle fiber, it induces a stretch reflex. And that stretch reflex will make this muscle maintain a certain muscle tone to cause a certain muscle tone. That muscle tone is very important and, uh, and uh, uh, to kind of keep us in a good gesture, good posture, and also uh, kind of ready for, uh, for the, uh, the movement that we are, we are going to conduct. So that's that, so let's talk about it. So this is the gamma motor neuron. This gamma motor neuron innervate into two end, two side of this intrafusal muscle fiber. The next thing is that this gamma motor neuron is influenced by our brainstem. So you need to know that when the people has a brainstem or uh, the neck, like a transaction or damage, then that pathway cannot pass on. Then the person's muscle tone will be, will be influenced. So brain stem, this brain stem particularly is the reticular formation. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the reticular formation has two portion, pound time and the medulla. Pound time is one to excite, medulla is one to relax. So these two will work together to adjust the muscle tone. They will, pound time will excite the gamma motor neuron and uh, it will increase the muscle tone. So this one sent to the gamma motor neuron, gamma motor neuron contract the side of the intrafusal muscle fiber. And then it will stretch the, uh, the, uh, the center portion of the intra, intrafusal muscle. Then, it will, then it will induce, trigger this muscle spindle 1A. This 1A will then, then send signal into the spinal cord, innervate with the alpha motor neuron to cause a stretch reflex. And by doing so, the muscle maintain a muscle tone. So this is a stretch re reflex. A very simple one, the, probably the simplest one. This is the monosynaptic stretch reflex. Single synapse, synapse, that's it. Monosynaptic reflex. So the uh so the that lead to uh the uh the the, the one of these these uh, uh upper motor neuron, the reticular. Radicular spine, radicular spinal tracts, radicular, radicular formation in the brainstem. This function is to affect the gamma motor neuron. So that is right here. So that is right here. So the radicular 
spinal tract, it will send the major one is to excite the gamma motor neuron. There will be a smaller innervation to the alpha, not entirely known, but there is where the, there, the major, major function is to excite or influence the gamma motor neuron. And the uh, gamma motor neuron innervate into the intrafusal muscle fiber, stretch the muscle spindle, and then muscle spindle send signal into innervate the alpha to cause muscle contraction. So reticular, reticular spinal tracts is one to influence, to modulate the muscle tone, maintain the posture through the influence on the gamma motor neuron. All right, so we know that. Now the reticular spinal tract has two sources. One is from the pontine and the other one is from the from the medulla. So this is example from the pontine, but the uh, but it also have the other one from the medulla. We will talk about that. I think it's on, down here. So reticular tracts uh, has two sources. One is the pontine reticular tracts that excite the gamma motor neuron to increase muscle tone. Medullary reticular spinal tracts inhibit the gamma motor neuron to reduce the muscle tone. And that is this figure here. So if an experiment or a, a test to test the muscle tone is to conduct the, uh, the uh, patellar, patellar reflex. This is stretch reflex. And uh, if we excite the pontine uh, nucleus, it will send out the pontine reticular spinal tracts to excite the gamma motor neuron that will enhance the res response of the patellar reflex and that indicate the enhanced muscle tone. If we excite the medulla, spinal, spinal uh, reticular spinal tracts that inhibit the gamma motor neuron and that will reduce the muscle tone. So that's that. Let's go back to this one here. So, so by knowing that, by knowing that, how can you explain, how can you use one sentence to tell me what's the importance of the gamma motor neuron? If I don't want to use one sentence to, to say the importance of the gamma motor neuron, it will be that the gamma motor neuron influence the muscle tone. So we can get the conclusion that when the gamma motor neuron is excited, we will have hypertonic muscle. If the gamma motor neuron is not excited, we will have the hypotonic mo muscle. So that's the relationship of the gamma motor neuron and uh, the muscle tone. A lot of time we need to have the gamma motor neuron function while we conduct any voluntary movement. Uh, it's called the alpha gamma co-activation. So any signal sending into the sending into the uh, lower motor neuron, uh, if it's excited the alpha, it will also excite the gamma. Uh, it's because that if we only excite the alpha, right? We cause the muscle contraction. Then the intrafusal muscle fiber is not the one get excited. The muscle will become loosened and uh, the tension is lost. Then the muscle spindle become not sensitive to the, uh, has no signal, it's not stretched. And so muscle spindle reduce its sensitivity to the muscle condition. And that is not good because when we do any movement, we need to know where is our muscle. We need to maintain a proprioception. So, so, so we cannot let this intrafusal muscle to be loosened. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that's why we need to 
when we excite the extrafusal muscle fiber, we also need to excite the intrafusal muscle fiber through the gamma. And then we can maintain the tightness of this intrafusal muscle fiber. And that will allow this muscle spindle continually send good signal. Even though it's reflexes, the secondary still can send signal, but we lose the signal from the primary. So it's, 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 not, it's not perfect. To make it optimized, we will excite the gamma as well to allow this primary muscle window sending out signal to the brain. So we know the location. That is very important to complete because everything you do, you need to have the proprioception. So that's that. So that's called the alpha gamma co-activation. Uh, the and so that is that. And, uh, and uh, so we, from here, we have the idea that even though these lower motor neuron, these lower motor neuron control, these lower motor neuron control the movement, directly excite the muscle control the movement. These lower motor neuron are basically heavily influenced by the upper motor neuron. And uh, there are four major pathway from the upper, upper motor neuron, including the vestibular, radicular, rubral spinal tracts, as well as the cortical spinal tract. So we will summarize them down here. These upper motor neuron inference to the lower motor neuron are called the supraspinal pathway. There are four supraspinal pathway. Vestib vestibular spinal tracts from the vestibular. This is the one influence our, maintain our body balance. So this one uh, is a reflect, reflective uh, movement that we will maintain our body balance when we are reaching to any imbalance. And uh, the way to do it is that we need to detect the body balance. The way to detect the body balance is from the vestibular apparatus in the inner ear, working with the cerebellum to conduct that. We also have rubro spinal tract from the red nucleus. This is one received signal from the cortex. So this is the voluntary. Voluntary one include this rubro and also cortical spinal tracts. These two basically is the voluntary movement that uh, cortical is the direct one. Rubro is more like a support one to support the voluntary. This one is the body balance. Radicular is one to control the muscle tone. So let's start by looking at the radicular, the one that we already mentioned about. There are two types, uh, two sources. One is the pontine. The other one is the medulla. Pontine and radicular spinal tracts excite the gamma. Medulla re radicular spinal tracts inhibit the gamma. So one, the pontan increase the muscle tone, medullary reduce the muscle tone. Usually these two work together as a way to increase, reduce the muscle tone. Uh, one thing very important is that when we act on a local, local motor movement, uh, such as walking, uh, swimming, any lo local motor that is basically circulated, uh, that is basically uh, generated by the local motor circuits in the spinal cord. So it doesn't really rely on the brain, but the brain can influence it by adjust this muscle tone. Because when you walk, you need to uh, repetitively increase one muscle tone and then relax the other muscle tone increase the muscle tone, relax the other muscle tone. So this alpha, so this pontan and the medulla basically has to generate the same pattern, the same, the same rhythmicity with the local motor, uh, lo local motor circuits in order to make this movement more smooth. So that's that.
And uh, and uh, so this one is that the pontan excite the GABA motor neuron, medulla through the medullary reticular spinal tracts inhibit the gamma motor neuron to reduce the muscle tone. So that's the reticular spinal tracts. Now the next one is the vestibular. Vestibular is to maintain the maintain the body balance. Vestibular receives signal from the cerebellum as well as the vestibular apparatus. There are the vestibular nuclei has four nuclei superior, lateral, inferior, and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and the medial. So there are four. Uh, superior and the inferior are the one that communicate with each other. The one sending out the vestibular spinal tracts are these two. One is the lateral, lateral spinal, lateral vestibular spinal tracts, and the medial vestibular spinal tracts. So that's these two. And the 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 the, the function of these two are very similar. These two are all to control the body balance. However, these two innovate different region. The medial, medial vestibular tra spinal tracts innovate into the neck of the muscle. So it basically, when we fall, we need to keep our head from hitting on the ground. So that is a reflex to control the head. The lateral is one to control the body portion underneath the, 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 the neck. So this one basically is to excite the extensor to stabilize, to excite the extensor muscle to, when we fall, we will excite the extensor muscle to prevent the damage to our body. So that is the vestibular spinal tracts to keep our body is a is a reflective uh post posture adjustment uh movement so that's that and uh, this one showing you the later one the one that affects the the uh the the body balance underneath the neck so I just want to use the one to show you that they act on the extensor muscle. It doesn't really show it here, but it showed this one here quite clearly. So this is the lateral vestibular spinal tracts act on the muscle underneath the neck. And then they excite the extensor. And the, the way that it get triggered is to trigger uh, by these two neurons, two group of the nerve. One is the vestibular input in the inner ear, it will immediately excite the extensor to keep our body balance and uh, to conduct our posture and the balance. That's all related. And uh, it's also influenced by the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum, the major cells in the cerebellum is the Purkinje cells. Purkinje cell is not an excitatory neuron. This is a gabinergic neuron. So it's an inhibitor neuron. So it sends out an inhibitory signal. It sends out an inhibitory signal to the vestibular. It sends out an inhibitory to an uh, outer neuron. This outer neuron is the vestigial nu nucleus. This will will excite this one, but because this is negative, next positive, so it's basically it's a negative. So it inhibit. Through these two, they inhibit the vestibular. So basically that this one excite, cerebellum inhibit. And, uh, and basically this is kind of a break to this one. This is the accelerator. And uh, a lot of time brain has two circuits work together. One excite, the other one inhibit. And that gives us the room to improve our movement. So say we are working on the uh, some kind of like dancing, right? You need to move while you need to keep your balance. And you can imagine that with this difficult movement or dancing that a lot of time people fall. 
and uh, and uh, and uh, stand up and try it again and fall, stand up, try it again and fall. So we lose balance, but we continue trying. And that's because that these two portions, probably this one is too strong, this one is too weak. And by repeating it, our brain can adjust the strength from these two input in order to achieve the optimal stimulation, optimal circuits in order to complete this movement while maintaining our body balance. So that's that. So that's the vestibular. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this one just sum summarized the one we just learned, the reticular from the pontine and the medulla, vestibular spinal tract, reticular spinal tracts. One thing I want to show you here is that these two tracks, even though these are two different tracks so, uh, from two different nuclei, these are all influenced by the cerebellum. So cerebellum has the, has the uh, process signal to influence the vestibular. Cerebellum also process signal to influence the reticulum. So your muscle tone is influenced by the cerebellum. Your body balance is influenced by the cerebellum. And you can imagine that these two has to work together. Your muscle tone has to work together with your body balance. If you are if you are going to excite an extensor, but your muscle tone is so weak over there, it's not going to work. So that is that. And so just want to show you that this is very important. This basically go back to this slide that we talk about cerebellum influence the basal ganglia. I just show you that cerebellum influence the vestibular and the reticular. Later, you can see that cerebellum also influence the red nucleus. So that's that one there. So that's that one there. Now, the next one is cortical spinal tracts. This one is a signal from the cortex and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and send out a signal into the spinal cord. This track is also called the uh, pyramidal tracks because their neuron is called the pyramidal neuron, pyramidal, like shape, like pyramid. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this one located in the cerebral cortex. So this tract is also called the pyramidal tracts. So one quick question is that, what's the major neuron send out signal to the cortical spinal tracts? Pyra pyramid, pyramidal neuron. All right, another one is the rubral spinal tracts. This one coming from the red nucleus. Red nucleus receives signal from the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum. So this is also, uh, the major function of this one is to conduct the voluntary working with the cortical spinal tracts. And so when the patient, if the patient has cortical spinal tract damage, the patient may still be able to conduct the voluntary movement because there is still a second path that is the cortical reticular right here. Cortical reticular, cortical rubral tracts. Sorry, cortical rubral, not reticular, red nucleus. Cortical rubral tracts to provide that voluntary movement signal into the red nucleus, then through the rubral spinal tract to complete that movement. In addition to that, red nucleus have a function that is to receive signal from the cerebellum. So, so here is, is just another demonstration that cerebellum heavily influence our lower motor neuron to complete a voluntary movement. So this one, uh, red nucleus receives signal from the cerebral cortex. This one is a supplement to the cortical spinal tracts for the voluntary movement. It also receives signal from the cerebellum. And this one is especially important for the, uh, to, for the modification of the motor performance. So basically that uh, 
we need to get the information from the cerebellum. Cerebellum, in fact, also receives signal from the cortex. So, so cerebellum is in, important to, 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 con, to influence our body balance, muscle tone, as I mentioned before, because it gets information from the vestibular apparatus and the cortex. So the cerebellum is the one knowing what brains want and also knowing our body balance condition. So it has these two information to gather together, integrate together. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, when it's sent to the red nucleus, it's the one that to provide that information and to modify the movement in order to be able to maintain body balance while completing this movement. Uh, Rubro influence the limb flexor to conduct the, uh, mainly the over the upper extremity. So in contrast to the extensor that is triggered by the vestibular apparatus, vestibular spinal tracts, this rubro is the, uh, uh, the flexor in order to conduct this fine movement. So that is that. This is the rubro spinal tracts receive influence from the cortex as well as the cerebellum. You probably noticed this. So this is probably the end. You probably noticed that cerebellum look quite different in different uh, 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 tracks. So here you can see this is cerebellum. Here we have the inter uh, positus nucleus as well as the dentate nucleus as the their output nucleus right here. We also see that in here we have the cerebellum using the vestigial nucleus to send out signal. So, so this today gave you a little bit hint that cerebellum has different output nuclei and the different output nuclei communicate with different nuclei in the, in the brain stem. Uh, vestigial communicate with red, reticular formation and the vestibular nuclei in the brain stem. The interpositor, interpositus nucleus and the dentate nucleus communicate with the red nucleus. It's a little bit upper portion of the brainstem uh, to communicate with the brainstem. So, so don't need to worry about the cerebellum for now, but you will see it. You know, just right next lecture, we will talk about the cerebellum. And this is the one that's the topic that cerebellum has different nuclei, output nuclei, and uh, to communicate with different portion of the brainstem. So that's that. And this one gave you the idea that cerebellum is very important, even though that the lower motor neuron is the one that control the, uh, the fine movement, the muscle movement, muscle contraction. They influence by three nuclei in the brainstem and these three nuclei in the brainstem are influenced by the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is the, here showing you, it's probably even clear. Cerebellum communicates with the brain through the thalamus. Cerebellum sends signal into the brainstem. Three nuclei here, three, three type of nuclei here. Send out signal to the spinal cord, communicate with the lower motor neuron. So cerebellum is very important in the voluntary movement. And that ends it, and we will continue on next one, which is the cerebellum.